Agriculture is a struggle, especially in developing countries where climate change is also an imminent threat. Hello and welcome, I'm Sadi Katiwari and you're watching Eco India. As a journalist, when I travel across the country, one of the biggest problems and the most common problem that I see are the increasing struggles of farmers and their rapidly declining incomes. And yet there are alternatives that offer opportunity and hope to cope with an ever warming world. The Maratwara region in India's western state of Maharashtra is one of the most drought-prone regions in the country. It has also been in international headlines for the high number of farmer suicides that happened here. Long dry spells are often a direct cause for economic distress. But for one community here, switching to a drought-resistant crop variety has made all the difference. These cocoons won't ever produce butterflies. Spun from a 900 meter long silk thread, they're too precious. They provide Shiva Jirao Patel with an income. That's a welcome new development. We used to make no money with cotton. Today I'm earning about 100,000 rupees a month. There are still some cotton fields here in Marathwade, Maharashtra's traditional cotton growing region. But climate change is taking its toll with increasingly long periods of drought, followed by heavy rains, which destroy the harvests and threaten livelihoods. As a result, there's a high suicide rate among farmers. In the last six months of 2022, Desperation led more than a thousand farmers in Maharashtra to take their own lives. The village of Rui, the Hindi word for cotton, is also affected by climate change. In the past, everyone here made a living from cotton, including Shivajiral Patel and his family. But the plants need a lot of water. That's one of the reasons why cotton production went into decline. We had to constantly spray the cotton crop with herbicides and add manure to the soil. It was an endless cycle of spending on the crop. We barely earned anything from its yield. In 2018, drought destroyed the year's harvest. For the village of Rui, it was a disaster. At the time, Kalidas Navali had just been elected village chief. He'd been hearing about the potential of silk production, or sericulture. In India, sericulture is financially supported by a government scheme called the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. Launched in 2006, it helps distressed rural communities in India by helping locals secure a stable income. It provides farmers with nearly 85% of the investment needed to set up a silkworm rearing unit. Kalidas decided to take the gamble. There were two main factors. The first goal was to improve financial conditions for villagers. Silk is a high yield crop and has better monetary value on the market. It's a high demand textile. And secondly, it can be grown with very little water. What started out as an agricultural experiment has transformed into a large-scale silk farming operation. Today, nearly 600 farmers from Rui have switched to sericulture. They started out with two silkworm eggs first, and from that they got 200 kilos of silk cocoons. When the farmer sold his product for 120,000 rupees, he couldn't believe it. He'd never made that kind of money from 10 acres of cotton farming. With just two acres of sericulture, he earned a lot of money. That's how it started. The sericulture model at Rui soon started to catch on in the wider region. A growing number of farmers are now planting mulberry trees, which are kept very short to improve the harvest. Their leaves provide food for the silkworms. The mulberry trees are hardy. They grow for several years and require much less water. That makes them ideal for this drought-stricken region, according to permaculture expert Seema Hardiker. 
She works closely with the farmers in Maharashtra. In sericulture, you can't use pesticides at all in your mulberry plantations. So that is an advantage because your soil and water is uh, saved, it is out of uh, the danger. And then uh, uh, in, uh, in rearing the, 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 the shades of uh, where the silkworms are uh, red, I guess a few disinfectants and uh, the things are used, but not directly pesticides because again, your, the insect is sensitive. The villagers run the rearing unit in Rui together. As soon as the larvae have hatched, each farmer receives 100,000. For the next 20 days, they feed the caterpillars with mulberry leaves, several times a day. After that, the caterpillars start spinning the precious silk thread around themselves to form a cocoon. Just a few days later, the cocoons are harvested and sold at the silk markets, with prices going according to weight. Many women in Ruri are also employed in the business. We're now self-sufficient and not dependent on others for money. Even the men in the house respect us for this. It's definitely boosted our confidence as women. But there's also a darker side. Critics say many children are employed in silk production, although Kalidas insists that's not the case in Ruri. Another criticism is that to obtain a single long thread from a cocoon, the larvae mustn't be allowed to hatch, so the factory workers heat the cocoons in water to kill the larvae. The mulberry trees also need water. Right now, the farmers are using precious groundwater, but Kalidas and his team have set up several ponds to collect rainwater. How are you filling your farm ponds is very important. Farmers are filling the farm pond or just using them as a storage to pump the groundwater and store into a farm pond and then use it for irrigation, it is not at all recommended because your groundwater is safe, which is in the earth underground and it is safe from the sun. But if you are filling your pond by giving some catchment and uh, diverting the rainwater, whatever rain you are getting during the season to the pond, it is good. It is a good practice. The silk from Rui has now made quite a name for itself. At first, the farmers used to have to travel a long way to the markets to sell their cocoons, which increased their costs. But after one year, once our quality and quantity improved, we told the traders that if you're interested in our supply, then come to our village and get it yourself. So today, those traders come here to buy our produce, and the farmers don't have to travel anywhere to sell it. The farmers in Rui have also received financial support from the local authorities. Banks are still reluctant to lend to farmers. Some of the villagers have now achieved a level of prosperity and own their own car or even a house. But the biggest achievement is that in the last five years, we haven't had any farmers in the village committing suicide because of a lack of work. For me, that's the biggest win. The honey in my healthy lemonade, the beeswax in my lip balm. Well, we can thank the honeybees for all of this. And while they're actually bad for the environment because they compete with wild bees, which is actually the species that helps preserve our biodiversity, if used wisely, in agriculture, honeybees can help boost the incomes of farmers and the productivity of the field, and that too naturally. Nitin Singh is busy inspecting his bee colonies. He's a specialist in environmental biotechnology. After researching cures for bee diseases in Germany and in Israel, he returned to his hometown of Lucknow in 2015. And the region needs him. Wild bee numbers have been declining here for decades. Without their pollination work, farmers have seen a significant drop in yields. To compensate, Nitin Singh provides a pollination service to farmers by renting out honeybees. We take bee colonies already set up in places like maize and millet fields and transport them to new fields through the migration process. If a farmer's crop production is 80 kg, then they can increase it to 100 kg by beekeeping. Nitin Singh owns a thousand colonies of the honeybee 
Apis mellifera. To collect nectar, the insects visit up to 100 flowers in a single trip and can make 20 trips in a single day. In the process, they move pollen from plant to plant, aiding the pollination of flowers, vegetables and fruits. Their single purpose here is to support the farms, unlike wild bees that benefit farms as well as biodiversity. But all kinds of bees are generally in decline because of one main factor. So when we use pesticides to kill the harmful uh, pests, we also kill the useful pests along with it. And bees, because they directly feed on the plants, they directly go to the uh, flowers, they get the uh, direct hit of the pesticides. So one of the major reasons is that. And across the globe, many countries have realized that and have banned all pesticides which harm bees. It's not just harmful farm practices that are impacting bees. Climate change has altered weather patterns, disrupting seasonal connections between bees and flowers. The uncertainty of the blooming season has put bees under immense stress. As national statistics show, in the last 25 years, India has lost more than 40% of its bee stocks. This farmer's yields of tomatoes, chickpeas and mustard have all suffered as a result. Ram Sahade's fields are located some 40 kilometers from Lucknow. This flower here will dry out unless a bee comes along. If it sits on it, it gets more nutrients. My yield had gone down by 20 or 30 percent. Compared to our previous crops, this one is going well. All these flowers are doing well. This plant is four months old and is still growing thanks to the honey bees. Before, I would run out of produce to harvest in two to three months. After learning of the threat that pesticides pose to honey and wild bees, Ram Sahare switched to organic farming. Because while beekeeping may help farmers, wild bees help the planet. They pollinate entire forests. They help keep other species alive and are in desperate need of protection. Scientists say that everyone can help save bees. One of the very easy methods of bee preservation is to increase the number of wild plants. So it's very easy for us to just uproot the weeds and throw away. What we don't realize is that they are actually um, a source of pollen for the bees when the main uh, cash crops are not there. So these, uh, uh, you know, they are a kind of buffer, a reservoir for the bees. And we need these reservoirs in more numbers. So they are more likely to sustain the vagaries of nature. And they are more likely to thrive. And as long as they thrive, they become a very, very good source of nectar and pollen for the bees. Pollinators play an essential role in feeding a growing population and maintaining biodiversity, which we really need. The bee has even come to represent the survival of the human species and protection gives us and the bees our best shot. Phosphorus is fundamental to life. It is essential for the creation of DNA and it is also a major component in commercial fertilizers. The only problem is the Earth's supply of phosphorus is not unlimited. And more than two-thirds of the world's reserves of phosphate rock are located in a disputed, conflict torn region in Africa. In such a dicey scenario, our reporter has explored one such solution which is available to all of us. What's in our bones, DNA, and feeds 8 billion people? Phosphorus. It's an essential element that sustains all life on Earth. It's also in your pee. More on that later. But the vast majority of it goes into making fertilizer. Why? Because without it, we wouldn't be able to grow enough food. The problem is that there's a finite amount, and roughly 70% of it comes from just one place. The bigger problem is that we're wasting most of what's already there. Every individual is just throwing away a loaf of bread every day. For countries like India, which is 90% dependent on imports, the dwindling access could be alarming. Plus, phosphorus is also causing some massive algae issues. But if the world's food security depends on it, what can we do about the potential shortage? What alternatives do we have? And could our own pea save us? Thanks to a German scientist boiling hundreds of gallons of urine in 1669, we found phosphorus, the 15th element in the periodic table. Fun fact, he was trying to find out how to make gold. Anyway, what is phosphorus? All organisms need phosphorus. It's an essential nutrient uh, and an essential component of life. 
This is Barbara Cade Menon. She's a renowned soil scientist based in Saskatchewan, Canada. It's part of our DNA. It's part of our cell walls contain fossil lipids. It's part of our RNA. Today, roughly 80% of the world's phosphorus is used for agriculture. Because it's a structural component of cells, it's essential for cell division and plant development. Without enough of it, plants are stunted and don't yield as much. We've been increasingly using these chemical fertilizers on farms since the post-World War II period. Together with crop engineering, it spurred the Green Revolution. This saw massive increases in crop yields, especially in the Global South and places like India. In 1960, our food production was like near about 80 million tons. Last year, our mil- uh, like food production reached up to 315 million tons. Sudeshna Bhattacharya is a scientist at the Indian Institute of Soil Science. I definitely will give this credit to fertilizer application because before it was, there was no knowledge about that. Worldwide fertilizer use increased six times from 1950 to 2000. So where do we get all of it from? To answer that question, we first need to show you the world's longest conveyor belt system, which can be seen from space. It's transporting the raw material, phosphate rock, from the Bukra mine across the Western Sahara Desert. Roughly 70% of the world's reserves are in the Western Sahara, a heavily disputed territory currently controlled by Morocco, which the UN says has been unlawfully occupying the area. A rebel army has been fighting for its independence. The largest reserves are spread across North Africa, followed by China, Brazil, South Africa, and Saudi Arabia. Less than 20% of the phosphorus used in agriculture actually ends up in the food we eat. That's partly because phosphate fertilizer is notoriously inefficient. It binds easily with other minerals in the soil, which makes it unavailable for the plant. We are like applying 100 kg of phosphorus. A plant is able to get only 8 to 10 kg. Some part will go to nearest water body, but maybe 80% of that will be precipitated in in soil. That's why the industry solution is to just chuck more on the soil. Phosphorus was relatively cheap. Adding a bit is good, a bit more will guarantee profits. This accumulated phosphorus is called legacy phosphate. How much phosphorus is lost in the soil also depends on the soil pH. Too acidic, like in wet climates, and it'll bind to iron and aluminum. Too alkaline, it'll react with calcium. But this has consequences. The use of chemical fertilizers increases the runoff of nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus into bodies of water. It leads to eutrophication, which kills off oxygen in the water. It also causes massive algal blooms, which can be toxic and produce earthworming methane when they die. And it's not just the waste from agriculture that's rampant. Phosphorus is everywhere, in our food, our tap water. So if we consume a lot of phosphorus, then that means... Essentially, what's coming out is the same. This is Jenna Senekal. She's a researcher at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences and also started a company that turns urine and feces into fertilizer. One out of ten people are like, that is disgusting. The amount of nutrients that are in urine is enough to grow uh, 500 grams of wheat. So basically, it means your urine, you could be growing, you could be producing a loaf of bread every day. She and her colleagues designed a system that essentially boils down our excreta and retains its nutrients. How? With a urine-diverting toilet. This solution is starting to gain traction in the West, but the upside is that it's particularly adaptable for places that don't have plumbing, since it doesn't need water. Unfortunately, household pee is just a small fraction of all the nutritious waste on Earth. There's also phosphorus in sludge and industrial wastewater, not to mention manure from livestock and dairy farming. One of the most scalable solutions is to figure out how to get all of it out and reuse it. Right now, the sewage treatment plant is to get the water cleaner, get it. We're not looking at it as extracting resources. We're not thinking of it as mining resources, but why not? The industry is still figuring out how to improve existing technologies to make large-scale removal economically viable. There's also been advancements in the methods of extracting phosphorus from animal manure. There's no shortage of technologies. It's just right now, it's still more cost effective to ship rock from Morocco than it is to try to get it from all these other sources. We can also start earlier in the process and help plants absorb more of the phosphorus. Recent research has shown that certain types of fungi and bacteria could be used in the future to improve crop yield and soil health.
uh, aim fungi they these are actually group of fungi they are a, uh, like very good uh, phosphorus scavenger you can say they can extend their hyphae and scavenge uh, uh, phosphorus from area where plant root cannot reach scientists are still researching how these microbes could be used for large scale farming however Transitioning to such organic agriculture takes time and could result in yield losses, a risk farmers are hesitant to take. But legislation could help move the market along. The EU recently legalized the sale of phosphorus recovered from sludge as fertilizer and is working on laws that will require more phosphorus to be removed from wastewater. Phosphorus is actually quite easy to recycle. If the government all of a sudden says, hey, you have to recycle 15% of the phosphorus that's in your wastewater, then innovations finally have a chance to come to light and start to implement. Frankly, the cost of it is <laughs> going to drive a lot of innovation when it was cheap, no one valued it. I am optimistic, and, and maybe I'm just optimistic in general, but to me, the, the recognition that it's there and we're talking about it, and maybe it will trigger the P revolution. See this banana? Well, the plant that it comes from contains good quality textile grade fibre, which usually goes to waste. But what good can come out of uh, this waste fibre, you can ask. However, there's a community of marginalised women in Tamil Nadu's Madurai district who are making beautiful fashionable items out of this waste fibre. Transforming banana fibre into baskets. Women here in the village of Tiruparakundaram in Madurai in southern India are taking a material once considered waste and turning it into something they can use. Part of the women's cooperative, Selvi started working here after her husband was imprisoned. The job offered her and her children a lifeline. After the incident, I was alone at home for a few days and relatives helped me during that time. However, they eventually left. Day by day, my kids are getting older and I didn't know what to do. In that critical situation, I came to this job. Selvi and the women are working at the Madurai International Center for Art or Mika. They produce over 20 varieties of baskets and more than 50 other types of handicrafts. The project aims to empower widows and single women, providing them with work which serves as a source of monthly income for them. The initiative was founded by Charles. He has been leading it for almost six years. When I was a kid, I used to give handmade gifts to my friends. I would gather everything from trees, including waste, and create small homes and other items. I received positive feedback from my friends. It was during that time that I realized nothing from nature is truly waste. This realization led me to consider making things out of natural materials and waste. India is the world's largest producer of bananas growing more than 30 million tons of the fruit every year. In Tamil Nadu, the fourth largest banana growing state, around 10 million tons of waste is produced. The banana waste for the Mika project comes from farmer Setu. He cultivates a field of around 2,000 banana trees. The growth cycle of the plants spans approximately one year. Within 10 months, the trees bear fruit and after harvesting, they are cut down to make way for the next crops. Initially, we used to throw away this waste, but recently we have started using it for multiple purposes. In particular, we use it as a raw material to make baskets. This has been very useful for us. The Mika baskets and other products are mostly exported abroad to countries like Vietnam and the USA. The women make around 8 to 10 baskets every day. They are sold for around 2,000 rupees, just over 20 euros. The women get around 150 rupees or 1 euro 65 per day. It might not sound like much, but they say the income brings them comfort and there are also other benefits. Every woman working here faces harassment and trauma issues from their family. We strive to give them hope for financial independence and the chance to support their children. When we come together and work as a team, all our pain seems to fade away. 
The women say nothing from nature is wasted. They believe their work benefits the environment, but more importantly, for Selvi, it also brings her closer to her dream to empower women just like her to support themselves and their families. I would love to get my hands on a handbag made out of banana fibers. Who would have thought? But it is ideas like these that are really making a difference to the farmers, to us and to the planet. But you let me know what did you like the most about today's episode and what would you like to see more of. I will see you soon. Until then, take care. Goodbye. Namaskar.